Toys team sent out the power bar, not in sun in sun. Clear soon the grid of venom the vatal him. Tiang trust the tea My name's Gareth Jones, and I've been the secretary of uh, Cymdaithus Oanglindur, or the Oanglindur Society, for the past seven years. St David's Day is an important celebration on March the 1st every year in Wales. When I was in junior school, for example, the girls would dress up in their Welsh costumes on the day, and the boys would carry plastic swords and shields and pretend to be warriors. I remember the name Glindur being called out as a battle cry, but we knew virtually nothing about the man or his story. He'd attacked the castle a couple of miles away in the village of Coiti, and that it had taken the country a long time to recover after the devastation caused by his campaign. But why he, a Welshman, would attack a Welsh castle was never clearly explained. In 1995, however, Professor R. R. Davis published a book, The Revolt of Owen Lindor, and this allowed Owain's story to be more widely read. Our society prefers to use the word uprising, though, instead of revolt. So, what's the story of Owain Lindur? Much of his life was shrouded in mystery, and although we're certain about some facts, such as the dates of key battles and sieges, most of the evidence was written years after the events had taken place. Owain was probably born just after the Black Death had swept through Europe during the middle of the 14th century. The consensus of opinion is that he was born in 1359, but this is open for debate. Similarly, the place of his birth is uncertain. He was most probably born at his father's manor house in Sachath, just to the west of Offa's Dyke and near to Oswestry. Street. In Welsh folklore, there were tales of the Marb de Rogon, or the Son of Prophecy, who would save Wales in its darkest hour. Many thought that Owain was this person, as he was descended from a number of the royal houses of Wales, and was probably the person with the strongest claim to be called Tawasog Cymru, or Prince of Wales. As a Welsh nobleman, or a Chelwr, he was expected to muster troops in support of the English king and Owen himself served with distinction in the army of Richard II on a number of occasions. Glyndwr had studied law at the Inns of Court in London under his mentor, Sir David Hanna, who was a legal advisor to Richard II. In 1383, Owen married Sir David's daughter, Marged, in the village of Hanma, and the couple made their home at Sachath. The family lived a particularly idyllic life especially after Owen had finished his military service to oversee his estates. In 1399, the rule of Richard II came to an end when Henry Bolingbroke returned from exile to usurp the English throne. In the years leading up to this, Glyndwr had a number of disputes with his neighbour, Reginald de Grey, over the boundary between the lands. While Richard was king, Owen had managed to win these arguments. But after Henry IV was crowned in 1399, the decisions went in de Grey's favour. On September the 16th, 1400, Owain addressed his supporters in Glyndavadwy, where they proclaimed him their prince, and the uprising officially began. Two days later, they attacked Rithin, the stronghold of de Grey, quickly followed by the towns of Denby, Frisland, Flint, Howarden, Hope, and Oswestry. Glyndur was an experienced soldier, as were a lot of his men and he knew that to confront an English army in a full-scale battle would, quite probably, lead to defeat. Instead, he adopted guerrilla tactics, which allowed his fleet-footed soldiers to engage the enemy in surprise attacks, and then disappear into the countryside just as quickly. 
This relied a great deal on the support of local people, and this support had been growing for him daily in the hope of finally overturning many years of oppressive English rule. I'm Charlotte Williams, I'm a film tutor and I'm also the founder of Here I Film, with a small uh, YouTube-based documentary project. We try and look at lots of different areas throughout Wales, lots of different bits of history and lots of, lots of pocket stories and things. Just finishing up episode two of our multi-part documentary series called Vel Gwaelod Llyn. In this we are exploring the reservoirs within Wales and the sort of political and cultural impacts that uh, losses of villages such as Capel Kellyn and Llynoddin and stuff, what they've, the impact they've had on Wales over sort of the past 100, 150 years. If you looked at it from sort of like yeah that outside perspective, I think there's there could be a lot to be negative on. It feels like compared to England and Scotland and stuff, there is less of a of an industry there. Moving away from having to compete with the likes of sort of Scottish film and film in England and things, it's most of other countries and compare the like the output or the amount of films or sometimes the quality, it might be completely different and it looks like Wales is lacking sometimes and it has lacked for a long, long time. The Lord tells me he can get me out of this mess, but he's pretty sure you're fucked. <laughs> it was because I think growing up in places like South Wales and stuff, there is a weird identity when it comes to sort of Welshness and Britishness and stuff. There is that sort of British Welsh attitude in a lot of the valleys. Fiercely, proudly Welsh, but also with that feeling that there's they're British and what changed for me and I think what changed for a lot of people actually is referencing the, there's the Euros in 2016 and I think it was the growth of like sort of Welsh football for example for a lot of people including myself that we sort of realised that well that we you know we can achieve and we can accomplish something as as a nation as well as Welsh people we can have something that's fiercely and proudly Welsh have that success you know have us succeed on that sort of world stage and, and I think it's that I think it's that feeling that we're not just you know attached to the successes of another country next door we can be relate to the people when you say three million people it doesn't sound like lots of people but three million people with a passion and a drive and an identity and I think that's what changed for me and I think then that lent into the types of films I wanted to make. I wanted to do stuff that had my identity attached more to that. I think the more then I filmed, the more I got involved in doing films within Wales, the more then that that identity grew. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a weird journey. I do sometimes like blow hot and cold on sort of um, the connections with Clint who sometimes it's great you, know, you you pass the little statue in Corwin and you get a little bit of a feeling you know you're like there is obviously you know those, those attachments to like I think loss would be the word I would use there where things like Clint Drew's story is based upon losing it's based upon negative aspects and I think that's sometimes the areas that I find I struggle with when it comes to sort of his role or his part within Welsh identity and Welsh history I don't always like to just focus on those those not losses and those negatives which is strange because i'm making a documentary which is essentially about the loss of identity and culture within wales but the point of what we're making with that is we're trying to do these tell the, the history as it as it was and what's happened but then build out of that how from those sort of lakes and things you know we've had sort of you know we've 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 created a spark you know all these things build and build and build and we create this new spark of positive welsh identity and i think i take the positives sometimes from that glindu story you can take that sort of idea of rebellion and i think everyone wants, loves that idea don't they of being the rebel being the sort of the outlaw and stuff like that and i think that's the parts that i really take from that story the feeling of I'm going to go and do something really rebellious and I'm going to rebel against the system. I like those stories. I think they have in many ways been left behind or in many instances 
I think there's the belief that a story that's so tied to a Welsh identity can't succeed, or the feeling that it has to be connected to something else. As, and I love films like Pride, for example, which has got that sort of strong Welsh identity and sort of other identities attached to that. But I guess there's that worry, I think, where, yeah, we're... I don't think people are confident enough in your Welsh stories and things like that. Confidently make something. Given us is more than money, it's friendship. When you're in a battle against an enemy so much bigger, so much stronger than you, and to find out you had a friend you never knew existed, well, that's the best feeling in the world. I think the more I've thought about it recently, the more I've been thinking that it's such a cool opportunity now because when you're inside the industry, you can see how much it's actually growing. So it's moving away from having to compete with the likes of, sort of Scottish film and film in England and things, and it's becoming its own identity, it's not an identity, its own sort of feel and things. And I think what, we've, what I've seen a lot of recently is through things like Film Cymru and stuff like that, that there is a new group of people actually coming through into the industry and taking sort of the experiences of Wales and sort of the experiences, their identity, they're applying that into their project. It doesn't feel like we have to become film in England or like film in Scotland to compete. It feels like we can craft our own identity and I've seen a lot more of that recently. I think I've seen a lot more films that tackle topics that are Welsh with things that like relate to like small communities and stuff like that. Lots of films, you know, talking about things relating to reservoir. And I think we'll see a change in that um, going forward. I think we're going to see a lot more people taking those risks and saying, well, I, these are the stories that are interesting to me. These are things I want to see. Every so few years we hear stories of people wanting to adapt, you know, like the Mabinogion and stuff like that, and adapting well stories and things. And we see a lot more of that. I think we've seen a sort of growing, burgeoning industry around that. You see it in things like games, for example, you know, another part of the industry where there's, there's a lot more in the past, say, two or three years of Welsh characters and Welsh locations in, in sort of games and stuff. And I think that's come from like a sense now that we can create things ourselves, there's a lot of independent games and same with film where people are saying well I like this idea, I like this story and I, I'm sure the pocket of people, there'll be enough people who will want to watch them. All it takes is one small project become that mega hit which happens every few years when you get a small thing which blows up and becomes massive.